Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Nats Chat. I'm Kari Reagan, the organizer and moderator of the Nats Chats. And tonight we are joined by Peggy Baruti uh, with the Voice Foundation co-sponsoring tonight's Nats Chat. So thank you, Peggy, for joining us. Kari, thank you for having me. On behalf of the Voice Foundation, I'd like to invite everyone to attend our annual symposium this year from May 27th through May 31st in Philadelphia. Uh, lots of marvelous presentations uh, on theory, studies, data, and applied science to voice. So we welcome you all. Thank you, Peggy. And tonight we Thank are you. also joined uh, by Dr. Adam Rubin and Juliana Codino who both are at the Lakeshore Ear, Nose, and Throat Center in St. Clair Shores, Michigan. And Adam is one of our most preeminent laryngologists, so we are so honored and thrilled to have the generosity of his time tonight. Um, of his many accomplishments, he has all written a, a book that he'll hold up momentarily called uh -huh. the Pit Stop, which is a wonderful book, um, and I'll let him share about it, but it's, it, helps people to understand in very simple terms for your patients or your singers. So I'll let him uh, expand on that a bit. And then also Juliana, who has um, a master's degree in speech language pathology from Buenos Aires, Argentina, and is currently working on her PhD. So they work on their voice team together there in Michigan. So thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's great. And Having us. I would like you both to share just a few minutes of a beyond the bio. What is it that we won't read in your bio that led you to be singers um, and interested in the voice? Who do you want to go first? Uh, Adam, why don't you lead us off? All right. uh, so uh, I'll try to be brief. I came from a family of, of uh, musicians and doctors. Uh, so I got very interested in theater at an early age. Um, I've always been kind of a ham, so that probably had something to do with it. But I was introduced to the field of uh, laryngology in the late 80s. I was touring with my college a cappella group, the Society of Orpheus and Bacchus, called the SOBs, and appropriately. And uh, we were touring Texas, and we stayed with host families. And I was lucky enough to stay with Dick Stasny, who was uh, one of a few laryngologists in the country at that time, wonderful person, talented guy. He took me to his office. He knew my interests. He showed me all his equipment. I was like, oh my gosh, I would, I knew I was going to go to medical school at some point, but I also was going to try, you know, my hand in the profession of performing as well. Uh, and then interestingly, my first equity show that I did was at the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia. And the lead singer, excuse me, excuse me the lead of the show, uh, suffered an acute vocal tear. Uh, and was pulled off stage. He actually ended up seeing Dr. Sadloff, Robert Sadloff, who 10 years later I did my fellowship with. Uh, so that's basically the, the course I took. And then I, I was probably only one of a few people who ever entered medical school knowing they were gonna be doing this very small uh, niche uh, field in laryngology. Oh, that's fabulous. I've not heard that those details before. I love that. What, how old were you when you were before med school at that point, when you had that experience? Uh, that was probably my junior year of, of uh, college with uh, Dr. Stasny, yeah. So okay. it was great. I still thank him uh, periodically when I get the chance to talk to him. Well, it makes you realize those moments in life that are life-altering that we now can offer the next generation, right? You Absolutely. never know that one conversation or that one moment that changes someone's life. It's It's extraordinary. Juliana, share with us a bit about your Beyond the Bio. I actually heard about uh, speech pathology when I was studying in the Conservatory of Music. I wanted, I thought I wanted to become a singer, and I was in my probably second year, uh, and my singing teacher said, I'm so excited about your next semester because you'll start the phoniatrics course, and all I've heard in these two years is what is exactly going on when I do this or that? And what is it, what are you doing when you use imagery? What, what is, what are you exactly trying to do with my, you know, I didn't, I don't even think I knew the word larynx. I mean, I was very young. And um, so she said, 
take full advantage of that course because I think that's something that you should look into. And I did. And after I started phoniatrics, after that first class I had introductory to anatomy and physiology, I knew that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> so I looked into it and then, um, well, in Argentina, the speech pathologists have a three year residency program and there are only two positions for a voice inclined residency. So I knew I had to do well in the exam if I wanted to do voice. And I, well, took a lot of effort and studying, but I did it. And then I, I think I was lucky with generous, very generous mentors uh, that also opened the doors to acoustics, which I'm very passionate about too. And, and actually one of my mentors, Dr. Minaldi, is through, through her I met Adam 12 years ago. <laughs> uh, and, and then long story short, I'm here. <laughs> I love that. And besides holiday parties, you both still sing, correct? You still perform. Adam, aren't you in a band still? We're both in a band. Uh, and uh, as, as, as are a couple of other doctors from the practice, we're talented musicians. So, uh, yeah. and, yes, and our clinical fellows in, in uh, voice pathology, who are both outstanding singers. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we perform at our holiday party every year. Actually, this coming year, we're gonna do a, a big fundraiser for ALS research uh, for the lab that I was a part of in, in residency, which is gonna be great uh, coming up uh, next October. We just got that gig. Uh, and we perform at my World Voice Day concert, our World Voice Day concert we do every year. So, uh, yeah. I bet, that helps. I bet it helps to give you street cred with you know performers coming in. It does, it does, it does mm -hmm. yeah. Well, so tonight we want to talk about keeping the singer singing. And so, um, Adam, as a laryngologist uh, with a room full of voice teachers, what, what are some broad strokes about what you want us to know to help our students? Well, first of all, I just want to say what a privilege this is to get to speak uh, to so many of you uh, via technology. Um, and I know that we know that we're preaching to the choir here, so I apologize in advance if any of this seems commonplace or I know a lot of this is familiar to, to all of you. Um, I guess if there were was a, a general message I want to put out there is, is how do we keep a healthy voice? And I think there are three main elements, three key factors to maintaining a healthy voice for, you know, singing for the, a lifetime, for enjoy, whether it's for enjoyment or career. Um, and those three factors are one, prevention of vocal injury, two, recognition of vocal injury, and three, early, timely, and appropriate evaluation and management of vocal injury. So just to expand upon that, prevention, obviously good training, vocal hygiene, and in general, just not assuming the voice is gonna be there when you get that audition or have to do that performance, not taking the voice for granted. Recognition, um, well, first of all, you all are the front line, right? There's probably no one better uh, to recognize a change in his or her uh, voice quality, whether it's quality, effort, range, so forth, than the singer himself. But as voice teachers, uh, you obviously are the front line in protecting uh, your students. So recognition of vocal injury and uh, then appropriate uh, and timely evaluation and management. So a big key element of that is if you have or your student has prolonged hoarseness or a change in something, a break in the passaggio that wasn't there before. Don't assume that's from allergies. Don't assume it's from their sinuses, from reflux. That has to be evaluated. Uh, and you know, you can have a problem, an injury that can be dealt with conservatively and get someone back on track very fast. Whereas if it's ignored, if it takes them three months to get to their primary care doc and then they get treated for laryngitis for three months and then five, you know, then it's six months later in a a mild injury might become something much more severe. And then it's very important to understand what a thorough evaluation of the voice is. And I know most of you probably do, but hopefully you get to a, or your student gets to a place where there's a voice team, where there's a laryngologist who's a, a ENT otolaryngologist with fellowship training in the voice, hopefully a voice pathologist or a speech pathologist with fellowship training, additional training in the voice, and possibly a singing voice specialist who's typically a, a singing teacher who has had experience, put invested time and effort to learn to care for the injured singing voice. Nowadays, a lot of uh, people going into voice pathology 
uh, for instance, our clinical fellows are or were professional singers that wanted to go, want to go down this career path. So often the voice pathologist is also a singing voice specialist as well. And then understanding that just looking with a mirror or a quick scope down the nose is not necessarily uh, a thorough voice evaluation. You need video stroboscopy and so forth. Now that's not always going to be available, but and then certainly, you know, if you're on tour, you got to take what you can get and hopefully you find someone who's had additional experience or training. And a lot of the residency programs now, you know, they're, they're most, they, most of these programs have laryngologists there. So the residents are getting better training uh, than they have in the past in voice. Probably went on too long, but that's the broad No, story. that's perfect. And do you tend to um, think of if a, if a voice teacher hears a concern or maybe somebody's recovering from a cold or something, I kind of think of at a two week mark, we should be seeing improvement. And if not, that's a referral, kind of a broad time frame. Do you have? There's, there's no question that two weeks is, is a pretty sound recommendation, but you know, it all depends what the circumstances are. Do you have to perform the next day? Well, then you probably want to get seen that day, or the, you know, um, um, and uh, you know, if it's, listen, if you get a cold or you overdo it a bit, and you can shut it down for a few days and you're better, great. You can't run to the dock every time. You know, and actually, you can't live in fear either. You have to have a healthy awareness, but you can't be paranoid all the time. You know, you got to, it's that balance. You don't want to live in panic either. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you're quiet for a few days and it's not back, there's something, even coming in after a few days for a high end singer, I don't think is unreasonable. You know, I'm constantly saying to my colleagues, not, not just for somebody coming out of sickness, but if you have a new student that comes to your studio and and you hear some inefficiency, some inefficient closure or something, um, and you don't see within it, and I'm, again, I'm not talking about sickness or anything, just basic technique, you're not hearing improvement in what you would normally in, let's say, four weeks time. I just feel that it is not our job as voice teachers to guess if it's biomechanical or technical. Now, I live in a place where we can get strobes really easily. In fact, at speech and hearing, they can get them for free. So I realize not everybody has that luxury, but by and large, I just, I, I become frustrated with teachers trying to diagnose when it's not our job, um, if they can get I, I know what you're, what you're saying, and, but you can get some general ideas, right? I mean, if you hear, and actually, I'll, you know, Juliana, and I don't I want Poliana to jump in, but she gave this beautiful introduction where she talked about she got interest, interested in acoustics and phoniatrics. The more the teacher, singing teacher knows, and you don't have to know it to that level per se, but the more they know about what's really happening at, at physiologic level, the, the better they're gonna be. And you can listen to a voice and if you hear raspiness that wasn't there before, perhaps a new break in the passaggio, you know that there's an impairment in vibration. You know, what's causing that you don't know, but you know that there's an impairment of vibration there, particularly if it's new. If it's a new student, you might not know, right? right. You might be the technique, so. No, and I like what, what you said, uh, Kari. It's, it's not your job to guess, and it's like, it, it kind of like gets, um, helps the, the singing teacher, I think, just recommend the you know, initial video stroboscopy as a, maybe just as a baseline stroke, uh, and if there are no structural abnormalities and everything is fine, then great. You have a, a new student to work with and deal with mm -hmm. what you hear. But you're right. You don't, you don't want to, as a teacher, just assume that that's technique or talent if something's persistent there or lack of talent. You know, uh, you, they, they need to be evaluated. Well, I'll hear things from teachers. I know Peggy does as well all the time. Like, oh, it sounds like reflux. It's like, what does reflux sound like? <laughs> you know, that kind, that kind of thing that I think more and more that's going to change. The more teachers are becoming so much, um, well, better educated. And I think that's going to continue as we move forward. So, um, Juliana, uh, Adam mentioned something about voice hygiene and the prevention. Would you like to talk a little bit about voice hygiene? Yes. Well, um, with prevention and, and vocal hygiene, I think that with uh, professional singers, sometimes they're dealing with eight shows a week. Uh, they they have they're auditioning uh, or waiting for long periods of time in line to to actually get into the audition. Uh, sometimes they have a vocally demanding day job while they're trying to build their career as professional singers, 
maybe at a call center or teaching or waiting tables in a noisy coffee shop. Uh, and all those things are uh, important to you know, discuss with uh, the, the patient, in our case, the students in your, in your case. Um, the ideal situation would be to prioritize and see what, uh, there's one little thing that uh, I like Adam says. How is it? Don't open your mouth unless you're being paid for. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Actually, that's what <laughs> I like it because yeah, it's sure. like they they are dealing with auditions and 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 preparing a show or maybe even you know they have tech week in 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 a week or so and they end up doing karaoke with friends because they you know their voice they're young voices and they still you know don't know how much they can push it and you don't want to find the hard way so that's a good thing to discuss. As also, of course, lack of recovery time, um, sometimes having to be ready for a role because someone is sick and they have to fill in and it's just no moments to prepare or anything. They just have to be ready. So I think that um, in prevention, I think I touched a, a few of the things that we usually discuss with patients in the office. There's a, a, a whole talking about a vocal hygiene and health is a probably be longer than the uh the hour allotted here but uh, just you know she talks about recovery could i, could I just uh, recovery is so important you know i mean you might be fatigued after a performance the key is are you going to go out for dinner afterwards and you know or talk to people in a loud environment or you're going to go home or cool down do some semi-occluded vocal track stuff you know and let your voice recover and so you can be ready you know for the next obligation those meet and greets are are terribly demanding and sometimes they they just feel they have to do it to just you know be devoted to their fans or or their audience but sometimes you know you, you have we have to explain how important it is this recovery time and and, and again vocal budgeting pr pr prioritizing mm -hmm. peggy I was just going to say in the same way that Adam has pointed out and Juliana also that the ears of the voice teacher are one of the most um, the best instruments we have for detecting a change in voice the ears of an experienced teacher so that's one thing that teachers can really contribute to this whole idea of early detection but also with regard to prevention really the only people giving advice to singers are primarily the teachers so it's incumbent upon all of us as teachers to have an understanding of the basic rules of vocal hygiene all the things that y'all are talking about and to make that part of what we do in our lesson plan it's up to us to educate these young singers about how to take care of themselves no question and they have to hear it many, many times. That's always, and from many different Absolutely. sources. Uh, you know, I that's mm -hmm. what I find surprising that, um, and depending on different circumstances, they might hear it one year post cold, and then they get back to everything's normal. Big problem is particularly with young singers. They don't understand if they haven't had a vocal problem yet. They don't understand that they. That they are the case, they're the instrument and the case. They can't put it away, you know, they can't put their violin in a case and close it up. They can't do that with the voice, you know. And uh, instilling that early is so important. And, and we see when we see traveling performers, they're doing their eight shows and then they're still going out afterwards after each show, having a drink, you know, uh, in a loud environment. And uh, it's just so key that they're, you know, to emphasize not to take that voice for granted. And if they're going into it for a career, they have to understand it's not a normal career. It's just not, you know, there are obviously a lot of challenges, but one of the biggest challenges is once you get work is staying healthy enough that you could continue that work, you know, so. I find there's a lot of education still not needed of singers recognizing that they speak and sing with the same instrument. Yeah, absolutely. You wanna, one, one of the biggest ways to protect singers' voices is to get them some speaking training because oh. most, you know, well-trained singers are gonna hurt themselves when they're doing, you know, performances where they have to speak or sing, particularly if there's an emotional part. If there's a character voice, you know, character voices can be very difficult uh, uh, on the instruments. So absolutely. 
Are you finding that the stigma is um, changing? The, I still see this. I see it on Facebook in different places, but the stigma around voice injuries and some of your more professional clients that come in. or um, Talk about that a little bit. What are you noticing? Do you want to speak, Kurt? No, go ahead. I, I think that... Uh, I think that there's been a lot of public self-exposure with people who've had, uh, particularly in the pop industry, uh, where people have had um, issues, have required surgery, have required being pulled off stage. So I do think uh, that's the case, but there's a balance, you know, and, and when you're talking about, uh, you know, we could get into discussion of when to pull the performer, you know, there's always that, that balance of um, looking you know, not performing at your best, well, actually, most importantly, performing and risking a more serious injury, uh, not performing at your best versus looking unreliable by being, you know, coming off too early. All those are, are, uh, are you know, difficult issues that often require long discussions with the performer. But I do think in general, the stigma of, of having a, uh, a vocal injury is, is, is being reduced now because of all the stuff that's been on the internet and in the news and so forth. And listen, you're an athlete, you know, it's just like the professional basketball player who injures the knee, they might have to, they might miss a game or two, you know, or they might have to be careful, they might, you know, but um, I guess, yeah, that's about it on that. I want to remind um, our uh, attendees that please, we welcome questions. And there's a little question box, so you can just type your question and I'll see it, and then I'll ask our guests the question. So please don't hesitate um, to ask early. Kari, Juliana mentioned before baseline strobes. You know, yes. getting a base It's very important uh, if you can do it because not everybody has beautiful, perfect looking vocal folds, yet they may sing beautifully and not have any issues. So it's very important to know what your vocal folds look like at baseline so that when you do have an issue, it's not attributed to something that really wasn't the cause. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be, go ahead, Juliana. It's, it's oh, so hard to get singers to get their vocal folds examined when they're feeling healthy, but that is right. the time to do it. Right, and now they can just take their iPhone and video the screen, you know, after you record it, and then they have it around with them. If they're on tour and they see someone, you know, they can show it to them, it's easy comparison. <laughs> well, you know, some people are even taking their phone and doing their own strokes. And also with the iPhone 5 after that, and it's like too big. <laughs> I'm sure somebody is developing a camera if they haven't already. That I mean, you know. <laughs> Peggy, you look I like have a question for y'all, if I could ask. Um, there's so much research being done now and attention being paid to lack of sleep and the impact of lack of sleep. We've understood it from studies in workplace accidents and now driving accidents. Could y'all venture an opinion about which is more important, adequate hydration or adequate sleep? And could it possibly be that that is also age impacted? It's a big question, but it's one I think about a lot now. Well, I think they're they're both really important. I don't know if they're both really the, the vocal folds love um, hydration. There's no question. If you're dehydrated, it's going to affect your vibratory capability. Obviously, uh, the old adage is you want to be peeing pale, you know, to monitor your, your fluid status. Um, so it's very important. But getting good sleep is important, too. I mean, all, you, you, your whole body has to be taken care of as a singer, right? I mean, it's, you, gotta, you have to exercise, stay in shape, uh, not just keep your voice in shape, but keep everything in shape. So... Uh, in truth, I don't know the physiologic consequences, but I, you know, we all know what we feel like when we don't get a good night's sleep, and it's certainly going to affect, at a very simple level, you know, the power source, your your energy, uh, your breast support, all that. So I think they're both pretty critical. Adam, you just gave a perfect. I wonder about it. Just oh go yeah, go go. Go ahead, Peggy. Peggy. Go I was ahead. just going to say, on a neuromuscular, from a neuromuscular standpoint. The response time is one thing that's impacted dramatically, which accounts for automobile accidents and workplace accidents. If you consider that singers and professional voice users are in need of, of extraordinary neuromuscular coordination, I can't imagine it's not a factor, especially the older we get. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> 
Well, and we have a, a great question from Abby Halpin, who says, who's this, I happen to know, she's a physical therapist here in Seattle. Um, and so your segue, Adam, about that is perfect. She says, what recommendations are typically given to singers regarding a whole body fitness routine? And how would that affect the health of their voice? I would think uh, good cardiovascular uh, exercise um, and, uh, you know, staying in shape. Uh, you know, keeping keeping the weight down if possible, you know, staying healthy. Um, and I'll jump in and say this, to, you know, in terms of specific regimen, I think that's individual, obviously, right? But um, I will say this for vocal hygiene, uh, you know, all those people in the weight room that are grunting and bearing down as they're trying to lift heavy weights, I, I like to give them my card. I don't, but I would like to. You know, that's horrible in the vocal folds, obviously. So, if there's trainers out there listening or people or you know physical therapists who probably knows this is you know it's very important to keep the breath flowing as you're uh, as you're exerting yourself do you have any recommendations not to be lifting heavy weights Juliana for instance, when you're working with people on yeah so when we are for instance, when we are dealing with a post-op patient or an acute injury we we are very um, uh, we stress a lot the fact that we want to keep those vocal folds from banging together. So throat clearing, coughing, uh, or weight lifting with, you know, bearing down anything that makes those vocal folds trap air underneath them. We try to give them alternatives because of course, when you tell them, oh, you won't be coughing or clearing your throat for seven days, they look at you like, what if, if I need to cough, what do I do? So we show them different ways to try to do it. And of course we say things like, if eating, eating popcorn makes you cough, try not to eat popcorn for this week or stay away from strong scents, anything that might trigger uh, your usual cough. Uh, and then with, yeah, particularly if you were asking me about weightlifting for post-op patients or acute injury, we just tell them, if you if you're not absolutely sure that you can do it with a good airflow, as Adam said before, then just stay away from it until we're, you're over your voice rest uh, period, and then we'll see how we can bring it back on. In general, light lightweight high reps if they're gonna if they're insistent on doing you know on doing things. But and uh, another thing about bearing down is I think I stole from Dr. Sadloff, but he used to tell all his post surgical patients no good sex. <laughs> It usually gets a chuckle, right? <laughs> I hope others are out there. <laughs> Can we edit that out, or is it? <laughs> it's out there now. I agree. And, right. I, and, and I get the other part when the patient says, "So, Dr. Rubin said no good sex. What about sex?" And I was like, "Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the, the levity. It's not much needed." All right, we're getting some good questions. So let me ask on behalf of Lucas Turrent. Obviously, vocal health is incredibly important. However, I have found in my professional circle that voice teachers draw the line too early and tune their turn their students into hypochondriacs. How do you navigate the balance between what can be attributed to technique and what can be attributed to vocal injury? Great question. Thank you, Lucas. So, I alluded that to that before in terms of you know you can't live in fear. You have to have a healthy awareness. But you're right. You can hypochondriasis is not unusual uh, in the working performer, unfortunately, because they're constantly worried about the about the voice. But in terms of how do you know it's a treatable technique or not, it, it's a tough question. I don't think you ever want to assume you know, that it's technique if there's a, you know, really a, a, something that doesn't sound right to you. Uh, and you're going to work with them a little bit and play with them a little bit, obviously, before they, before they uh, get to a, you know, uh, to get seen. Uh, but don't assume. And, and um, you know, if it's someone you're familiar with and you know if there's a change there, a change in vocal quality that wasn't there before, that's obviously a red flag. Um, and then there's some other little elements. If, 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 you know, Passaggio is the first place that's going to go uh, with a with vibratory impairment. Subtle vibratory impairment will affect that Passaggio first. And obviously, that's a very difficult area to smooth out technically. Um, but if there's a new break in that Passaggio, Particularly, you know, mezzo piano, they're not blasting through it. Obviously, if they're belting, they can you can belt through a lot of subtle vibratory impairment or not so subtle vibratory impairment. But you know, if you keep the voice soft to have them glissando upwards through their passaggio, 
on an ah vowel in particular, you'll hear a new break. There's something going on there. I want to add one thing. I, in my experience, when young singers, or not necessarily young, but first injury in a singer, hopefully the last, usually um, during the process of, um, well, timely diagnosis and management and treatment and then discharge, uh, I, we see how that uh, singer grows or develops this awareness that is going to keep them on the safe side you know, and we hope it's going to keep them on the safe side for a long time. So sometimes that, you know, until you you develop this awareness, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to consult, you know, make the consult when you're noticing something that your voice was doing and now it's not doing or it's doing that it wasn't doing before, as Adam said. And how, um, you know, after you attend a few of the Voice Foundation conferences, which are fabulous but you see the you know the high imaging strobe with the cough and the clearing of the throat you know and you hear enough lectures about being mindful of that but I actually then heard one of our laryngologists talk about let's not get so paranoid that we so where is the how do you instruct your singers about how paranoid to be about when they need to clear their throat and cough oh yeah well, some, sorry, I'm jumping. Um, some, uh, some patients are just are very paranoid from the beginning and you need to g give them the right information, but trying to maybe temper down those paranoid feelings. I, I sometimes get emails from patients uh, saying, I haven't coughed in eight days and I feel I'm choking with my saliva, but so it's like, that would be an extreme. Okay, if you have something, try the techniques, and if you absolutely need to cough, well, try it, uh, you know, without, because you can see that that uh, emotional situation is kind of like on the verge of becoming too much. Uh, so in, in my experience, sometimes you have to kind of feel what how paranoid the patient will get to give them the information in the right format for them and adapt it. Obviously, it's the same message, but sometimes you need to adapt it to different personalities. I love that because... Go ahead, go ahead, correct, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, it's true, because sometimes people need to be smacked in the face a little bit more, not literally, of course, to make your point that, listen, you really need to moderate and, and notice when you're glottal onsetting or coughing or clearing your throat, and other people, it's become, they become so afraid of it that it becomes damaging. When you, we teach them other techniques, tucking the chin, swallowing, hard swallow, breathy, clear. But I will tell you this, okay? <laughs> we see a lot of patients with mucus in their throat. And I will tell you, my estimate is that about 95 to 96% of them, there's no mucus in the throat. And it's great. When they come in and they say, oh my God, there's this big glob there. I got to, you know, we're looking, we show them, there's nothing there. And it's, it's probably a, a, a neuralgia or, you know, irritation there, you know, the nerves sending signals back to the brain saying there's something there, there's something there, something there. And uh, I do think that sometimes a little clear of the throat helps the voice. We've all been there, right? So what is it? Are you really clearing mucus? I think most of the time you're not. Maybe it's like a sensory reset. I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, we get the privilege of looking at people while they're telling us they have this complaint. And, mm -hmm. you know, the majority of them, truly do not. When there's mucus there, we see it. <laughs> that's oh, that's fascinating. Um, okay, a question from Heather Nolasco. What kind of professional should I go to or refer students to for help using the speaking voice healthfully? Uh, well, I, we, as speech pathologists, uh, when we work with singers, ideally when we're ready for discharge, we want to make sure that we have carried over all the therapy techniques that we use to recover the injury in their singing voice to their speaking voice too. And I, I can't say how many phenomenally great singers I've seen with great singing technique and their speaking voice is completely off balance. There's, they're, they have persistent glottal fry or they're, they're um, kind of in a, in a pressed posture and, and trying to speak a little bit lower than what their anatomy really wants to do. So um, 
sometimes when we're working with injured singers, we start there actually in their speaking voice and then that actually helps with their singing voice complaint too. You were gonna add up something, no, Adam? Well, it's interesting because she, she just made me think of this that there really is a deficit somewhere along the line because I think what she was alluding to is where do you send them to get speaking training if they're if they're not injured, you know, to get that. And and I I wonder because uh, having my own experiences uh, as a you know theater major and stuff, the voice teachers, speaking teachers that I work with did things that I'm horrified uh, about at this point now. And really the best people to probably to do that speaking training are uh, voice pathologists. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, the transition of where when someone's not really having problems with the voice, where does the singing teacher send them to get speaking training? And um, you know, honestly, the best people would be the voice pathologists. And a lot of voice pathologists, I know we have, I would just, they specialize with the acting voice. Yeah, absolutely. Peggy, yeah. what were you going to say? I think just, yeah, just a couple of quick things. And that is that one thing that most people don't realize is that not all speech pathologists are trained in voice. Absolutely. And you can get a speech pathologist who has no background in voice and doesn't really understand how to work with voice production. So for many people, that's difficult to find and, and really critical to find. The other problem, too, with our ideas about preventative care for singers, getting a stroke when you don't really need one and maybe seeing speech pathologists to improve or someone to help with speaking voice, is that singers, especially young professional singers, are traditionally the people who have the least amount of money. Often they don't have insurance. Just thinking about the practical end of it, which is so very, very difficult. And so they don't really have the money except when they are, yeah, and don't want to go except in a, when they're faced with an acute situation. Just thinking about the hard practical side. Right. Difficult problem. Do they have insurance? Right. Do they have deductible? You know, there are there are practical, uh, you know, issues associated with that. And then the, exactly, there are insurance companies that won't cover speech pathology, which is outrageous for singers. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. Yeah. points another oh, go ahead adam were you going to add no. another, another question from norma jean mccosco most of her students are young singers not professionals and she would love advice for helping them through all the colds that they catch at school well that's a yes all right <laughs> shake fewer hands kiss fewer people and uh for one thing you know uh, now honestly you know you got you got to try to stay healthy and and that's the way things are communicated the most the handshake in particular wash the hands not obsessively but enough um uh, and then otherwise you know if you have a cold uh and you want to um and you have to perform i mean that's the question you know rest hydration obviously tylenol to keep fevers down um, if you have to, you know, hydration, I think I already mentioned it, but it's doubly important. Uh, and treat the nose, okay? So your nose is a major resonator, obviously. So if you're very congested, you're gonna lose some resonation space and you'll probably put more effort on your, uh, on your voice box, okay? Um, so you can do something like aphrin nasal spray, but just for three days, you don't wanna use that more because it's physiologically addicting. Um, although it makes your nose feel great if you do have congestion. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, like I said, rest, preservation. Juliana, I'll let her jump in in a moment with things you can do with semi-occluded uh, things, cup phonation, things like that. And then if you have to perform and you're really struggling and there's no absolute contraindication for singing, such as a hemorrhage or tear, you know, when you got to get back on stage, you, you might need a, a short course of steroids. Yeah, and shameless plug. In your book, you have the rules for a cold, which yes. is very uh, Yeah, and then obviously, if they have to perform um, warm-ups, but be twice as mindful as usual, because you need to make sure you have the range you need for your performance. So that's where I, I like um, to show them cup phonation with a little, I don't have one here obviously, but a styrofoam cup with a little hole made with a pencil tip on the other side. I love that with a neutral ah, oh, there's not much you can do articulation wise, but working with your range, uh, with it's a low impact uh, exercise that I re really like for uh, a quick reset and, and warm up uh, in 
not great situations, it works. Um, SOVTs, all that good stuff we do in the office, uh, semi-occluded vocal tract exercises with the water, without the water, and, and making sure you, you have a plan on what you're going to do with that uh, particular song. If, you know, test that tessitura, obviously it has to be comfortable, but make sure you're going to do all the register changes you need to do and, and don't leave anything for, oh, on stage, you know, adrenaline does the rest because if you have a cold, your, your body's not going to function the same way. And that's when vocal accidents happen. On that note, depending on what type of singer you are or what kind of performance you're doing, if you can, whatever you can do to modify the performance uh, to, you know, obviously you can't do that if you're doing a Wagnerian opera uh, or, or a musical for that matter, but if you're singing uh, cabaret or you're, you know, singing with a band, you can change melodies, you can select your repertoire uh, better, you can have other people help you, you know, there are other things you can do just to preserve, to preserve. The key always with all this stuff, the big picture is you want to prevent a, a career threatening or a voice threatening injury that can't be fixed. And, and the main thing, the four letter word of, in vocal injury is scar, right? And particularly deep vocal pulp scar, we don't have treatment for that. So uh, whatever you can do to prevent that will help. You maintain can you, the two of you, could the could the two of you address the use of steam? People ask that question, steam, nebulizers. Do you have any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Adam. Uh, I think it's great. I think hydration, you know, hydration, there's there's drinking. And if you have a Lakeshore Professional Voice Center cup, it's also good for blowing your bubbles. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it's not a plug. They're not for sale. I just we give them to the person. <laughs> so, um, but I think steam is good. I think it's kind of external hydration. I think it's I think it's great. I have no problem with it. Yeah, we like to uh, direct this uh, Yeah, we, we encourage both actually. I want to now on that note though, um, I, I will caution people to not necessarily take their vocal hygiene advice from their cast members. That can be detrimental. I did my first summer stock show. And I wasn't used to all this stuff that I tell people not to do, I was doing. So I wasn't used to rehearsing as much, performing as much, socializing as much. I lost my voice early on in the rehearsal process and the lead. Uh, and I was doing a character voice. I was doing Doolittle and My Fair Lady because I was, I'd been bald for a while. So I always get these older roles. And um, uh, the lead told me, Higgins told me to um, uh, take aspirin around the clock, which obviously is a blood thinner which leaves you more stuff for vocal hemorrhage, which is probably what I had at the time. <laughs> uh, so in any case, be careful. But steam, harmless, probably beneficial. Why not? And Adam, would you also mention the use of ibuprofen along with aspirin? Just ibuprofen, to reiterate that. Aleve, ibuprofen, which is Motrin, uh, all that stuff are, are blood thinners. You know, it's I, I'm not absolute with this, you know, Peggy, and, and there are some health benefits for some of those too but you just have to be aware and, and let alone listen you know people are seeing into their you know uh hopefully their whole entire life so they might end up being on a real major blood thinner for cardiac issues things like that you know so uh, you just have to be aware you're more susceptible to that yep we've got some great questions so let's um, see if we can move through some um, many undergraduate singers get interested in the science of the voice or speech language pathology while studying and completing a music degree for those who show interest what do you suggest teachers recommend they do while completing their undergraduate degree to prepare for grad studies in speech pathology or med school prep mm. <laughs> well um, I am, I'm very, I, I mean, I'm getting to know the system here in North America, so I'm not sure if I'll be addressing all the options, but uh, one thing we, we like to see when we are um, recruiting our clinical fellows is that they had, you know, all that nice coursework related to acoustics and extra coursework in voice. Um, so there are, um, there are the summer vocology courses uh, that are phenomenal, uh, and I I know a lot of singers that have been doing those. Um, all the well, probably Kari, you have uh, more information for that question now that I'm thinking of. But well, thinking 
Yeah. Let me no, just no, no. So, Anything that can give them the big. Yeah, yeah so ahead. undergraduate and then there's master's programs, right? So uh, if you're undergraduate degrees in, in music and voice, this is first of all wonderful. It's a, you know, to think about one of these careers, whether it's going to medicine for laryngology or, or, or a speech pathology, voice pathology, it's great. You know, it's a, obviously a more secure career uh, and you can still perform and enjoy, you know, enjoy that. And one of our clinical fellows now keeps going back to do her church gigs. He's got a beautiful operatic voice. Um, but, uh, you know, the prerequisites you need uh, to get into these programs, uh, certainly for med school, and I expect for master's programs in speech pathology as well, they're typically, you know, the basic biology, chemistry, you know, those kind of things. I can't speak to speech pathology as well, but there will be prerequisites. Um, and uh, sometimes if you didn't do it in college, they have these post-baccalaureate programs, and you can go back and get your, you know, requirements that way. It's a little bit of investment in time, um, but, uh, I think it's they're you know they're great options uh, for for uh, people who are have the singing training and the music training but decide they don't want to do that uh, full time career wise performance wise. We're lucky at the University of Washington we have one of the top speech and hearing departments in the country. So I have had several students that come to study and they'll get a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Music and Vocal Performance and a degree a Bachelor of Science in the speech and hearing. Right. and then from there can go on and get their masters but they do a double degree and um it, it takes a while but they come out really well prepared to then go on and do the masters in speech and hearing and when they go to do their masters they should really look at the programs because some programs are more voice centric than others i mean some people come out of their masters with very little uh you know voice having, having had very few voice classes so it's are you talking about for speech we're talking speech. about a speech path degree, right? Because they could, they, you know, you got swallowing, cognition, uh, um, uh, autism. You know, there, there are so many other uh, articulation. There's so many other elements of speech pathology, and some of the programs are focused more on those rather than voice. Yep. Thank you for adding that. That's so important. Okay. So another question from Jessica Litzak, and I apologize if I mispronounce names. Um, she says, wondering if you'd be able to speak to the effects of orthodontics on the voice hygiene of singers. She often notices some major shifts and changes in voice quality and various new habits when students get new orthodontics, specifically traditional orthodontics using elastics, braces, and expanders. Do you have any insights? <laughs> wow. Well, I hate to say it, but my wife's an orthodontist. Uh, <laughs> actually, I love to say it, but uh, the reason I hate to say it, we actually, it's funny when we, um, when I came out of fellowship, Dr. Salop encouraged me to try to do some sort of study looking at exactly like this. I couldn't get my wife on board, but I'm still working on her. Um, you know, anything that I think theoretically, anything that changes your resonators, your resonation space is going to affect, you know, resonation. So uh, whether that's for better or for worse, I can't, you know, I can't say. You know, same thing with getting your tonsils out, things like that. I think so too. It's like it's. I uh, I wore orthodontics at age 20 something when I was singing and I it's it's it gets in the way and if you're gonna be wearing it while you perform you need to find a new way to do what you were doing before without them um, I used to do a lot of extra warm-ups like you know even massaging my upper lip to try to get it over the actual braces um, and, and always lubrication, because sometimes you get dry and your lip gets caught in there. Uh, and then with all those elastic um, bands that you mentioned in the question, Kari, um, that usually also adds a lot of uh, tension in the base of tongue and the way they're uh, opening that uh, oral cavity to get the, the nice uh, oral resonance that you're looking for. Um, so yes, definitely. It's a great question. And I would encourage all the, the nice warm-ups we do for, uh, with a special emphasis in trying to relax those jaw muscles and getting all those orbicular muscles ready for the performance. Was the question when the braces were in place or just having the structure of the mouth changed? I think the braces were in place. Oh, in place. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's going to be some some alterations, obviously, but it's not a reason not to get orthodontics. 
<laughs> I love that. Okay, Adriana Martinez says, do the speak, do you, any of you have suggestions for books and other resources for voice teachers who would like to learn more about vocal mechanism, physiological issues, et cetera? Oh, well, yeah. More, uh, you know, uh, scientifically intensive voices, but this is a good one to start with, the vocal pit stop. This, this book, I just, I'm sorry about the shameless plug, but I'll just tell this book I wrote, you know, uh, thinking about everything I wish I knew when I was performing that I that I know now. So it's it's written in, you know, not overly simplistic language, but not too heavily, you know, technical. But there are probably better books for learning more about acoustics and things like that. I'll let Foliana. Yeah. Uh, I can definitely create a list that you can share with the listeners because of course I'm not gonna remember the years and publishers and I have them in the office, not here. But uh, there's a great um, book by Bacon uh, on acoustics. I, the title of the book escapes my mind right now. Uh, but I encourage everyone who's starting in acoustics to reading the Acoustics 101 uh, for speech uh, and voice. It's a great book. Again, I'll, I'll share a list with you so you can uh, distribute it with the listeners. Um, there are, uh, there's another one by Kent, a smaller book. Um, also, the first three chapters cover everything we need to know to start understanding what's going on. The first time I, I, I understood that we could actually modify what was going on between harmonics and formants is when I actually read it in a book because you hear it and you know and you're doing it, but when once you read it and you see exactly how those interactions work, everything comes clear and that's how you can design a good exercise for your patient or student once you understand how that works or at least you have that idea in mind and then start testing and playing around but yes i'll give you a, a nice list because obviously I, I i only mentioned those two but there are more i'd and encourage stop. all of you to try to come to things multidisciplinary conferences like voice foundation paul voice things like that and that's a nice place to pick people's brains and uh, they're, they're a diverse group of people with a lot of different expertise, so it's a lot of fun. And a, and a nice book for an overview is Scott McCoy's An Inside View. A lot of pedagogy classes use that because it's sort of a soup to nuts overview, uh, not a huge amount of detail in any area, but you get anatomy, physiology, acoustic sound, hearing, you get so many elements. And now Sorry. with this third edition, edition is uh, excellent. Uh -huh. um, chapter on cognition. And right. you can also, if you have younger singers, he also has um, the basics. So the, the Your Voice and Inside View, the original, is goes into more detail. It includes secondary muscles of respiration, et cetera. Um, and, but there is also his basics, which is even a little bit simpler depending on the teacher's interests and needs but yeah i can't i i agree with peggy on that it's such an extraordinary resource for singing teachers without any bias you know here here are some of the facts to help correct folklore that still exists in the singing community mm -hmm. um well, hope you also individualize your training you know to that person as opposed to just old school palette up which all white or you know i think it will really help you know guide your individual students to produce, you know, to use their instrument in the best way possible mm -hmm. to, you know, I mean, the basic principle of all, you know, healthy voice production anyway is, you know, maximize use of the power source and breast support and the resonators, obviously, and reducing work here. But the more you know about the fine details of that, I think uh, will make, make you better teachers. And I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention the vocal athlete or Ingo Tietz's vocology for singing mm -hmm. teachers. Those are yep. two other really fantastic resources. I mean, the list could go on and on. Um, most of them are sitting next to me on the floor. <laughs> um, all right, so a few more questions. Let's see if we can get through. So this teacher has a 19-year-old female singer who is going to be singing a lead role of Joe March in the musical Little Women. 12 shows in total, some shows three nights a week, and two shows on the same day. So what preventative advice or suggestions can you have to help them stay vocally healthy? Wow. <laughs> well, we, I think we covered a lot at the beginning when we talked about prevention and, and vocal um, budgeting. Um, 
uh, you said um, which role is she playing again or is he a Joe, Joe. Joe. so she would have astonishing and okay cool. uh, well all that all the good stuff that we said warm up stay hydrated don't go for the karaoke singing after um, try to to keep your body in shape get a good night rest um, for young singers, too, I would say that it's hard to realize that you don't have to produce maximum sound every minute of the rehearsal. I think rehearsal periods is, is often when kids, young people get into trouble and they have to realize they have to pace themselves through those rehearsals, that every voice is finite and has a limit beyond which it cannot go. But pacing through the rehearsals is critical. And often if it's a school show or community, they got tons of rehearsals right before they open. Well, it's not just that, it's the, yep. it's the music directors sometimes, you know, they don't let them mark, they don't, or the kids don't know how to mark. It's one thing, right. you know, um, and they're expecting full volume all the time. They have to have that discussion, or maybe the parent has to have the discussion. Um, or the teacher but, has to be part of this and say, Yes, this is not right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it, it's a lot of it's common sense. She's got to, you know, preserve, preserve, preserve. So when she doesn't need to be using the voice, she shouldn't be using the voice. You know, not talking backstage, not talking to friends after the show. That's a killer, particularly on the two show day. You know, you know, not talking in between. Go and hide. You know, go, <laughs> go and hide or wear a sign and say I'll smile, but I'm not talking. You know, um, and I'll, although the th all those things for recovery, like the cup phonation Juliana talked about before are, you know, are very good uh, as well. But, but the key really is, um, is uh, preservation. Yeah. And then as, as we always say, you, you, you already have the, the role. You don't need to give a hundred, 200 percent on each yeah. rehearsal. So um, what it's, you before yeah. Peggy, I think it's I, just. I, I, I'd go even further than that. I'd say it's not, you know, most actors, particularly young, they feel like they need to get a lot of energy and, you know, and get 200% when they're performing. And, and the key, as you all know, particularly once you really work an actor doing eight shows a week with two on Saturday, two on Sunday, is finding out how little you can do to still put across a, a effective performance, you know, and, and that's all part of preservation. Mm -hmm. There are two last questions I want to get to because they are of, will be of interest to all of us because they have to do with the voice team. So the first one is kind of expanding the voice team to include a physical therapist. And they want to know if you have experience working with singers who have a muscul musculoskeletal injury such as back or neck pain that affects their performance. And if so, do you have experience working with the physical therapy as part of the rehab team? Do you want to address this? Um, go ahead, get started. Well, I'll think. We actually, you know, we do have patients, uh, you know, who have uh, those kind of issues. Um, there's, uh, in truth, I'll be honest, you know, it's a great suggestion. We have people doing physical therapy and we suggest physical therapy. Most of these people already have, you know, spine physicians and so they're in therapy, all, you know, physical therapy already. Um, so, but, you know, as, as part of the you know, it's nice to find people who uh, work with laryngeal massage and, and things like that as well. Uh, sometimes the speech pathologists are able to do that uh, too, but it's a, it brings up a great point. I think a physical therapist is, is certainly very important as part of the team uh, in those with patients with those type of issues. And, and in the field of physical therapy, they are often specialized to a particular sport or to dancers or to whomever. And what we need in the music world are physical therapists that are specialized to singers, to pianists, to instrumentalists. It's a it's a big need. Yeah. It, it, luckily, the wonderful Abby Halpin, who asked that question, is such a, a PT. So we're lucky in Seattle that we're starting to collaborate more in that field that, because That's she right. is a singer and understands the special needs. Well, no. Abby will be writing the next book on it then. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Uh -huh. I think it's a great, a great book. I'm uh, sure she's laughing behind the scenes right now. <laughs> no, but right. I'll make sure she puts that. Okay. No, uh, I would say there are so many things affecting um, posture, even in singers that play an instrument and they're looking at their left hand while they, they sing or and I think that it's a great addition to the voice team, if you, you know, uh, right. dealing with uh, incline in stages and how the singer 
ad adjusts to those changes as they tour the country. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a, it, it, it should be an addition. Think about it. <laughs> We're going to run over just a little minute because this last question probably would have been better 30 minutes in, but I want to ask it on behalf of Crystal Lau. She says, Earlier in the webinar, Dr. Rubin mentioned about singing voice specialists. Other than having extensive teaching experience, what exactly do they do with the rehab process? So, it, oh, with the rehab process. Well, I think that uh, a lot of that's gonna depend on uh, the voice pathologist and their experience with the singing voice, okay? So, I'm, and their accessibility to singing voice specialists. I mean, they're they're not everywhere to, you know, to be found. So. Like I said before, a lot of times the voice pathologists are, are prior voice teachers or singers as well, so they have the experience. And if they don't, then that is a person that is very important transitioning back to the singing voice and working with, you know, an injured singing voice and rehabilitating that aspect. And um, so I think that is an important part of the team that unfortunately is not available uh, everywhere, you know, at this point. Not everybody has a Kari, you know, uh, as part of their team. Um, but in terms of people who are interested in, in doing that and becoming that voice teachers, it's important, Carl, you can talk about your experience, but getting in with a voice team, working with a laryngologist, working with a voice pathologist, you know, understanding what they're doing and seeing how the natural tr transition occurs, you know, occurs there. Otherwise, a lot of times, uh, you know, the, you know, obviously we have very strong communication with the voice teachers, you know, as well, who are necessarily used to dealing with the injured voice like a singing voice specialist so there has to be some some guidance there if a singing voice specialist not available thank you that i mean that was very succinct and, and a, a nice way to wrap up i think peggy re represents you know the the singing voice specialist that worked uh, until she retired from there last year at, on site on the team Right, Peggy, and then I, of course, represent that independent who is cultivated and works a, a relationship with the laryngology and works in affiliation. So I think singing teachers are, um, we're finding different ways to cultivate those um, relationships, but it's working alongside the team that's the most important part. I was And I would suggest also, yep, Adam, go ahead. Because I got to work with a team with Peggy, uh, and get to see that, which was phenomenal. If you ever, uh, you know, are at one of the Voice Foundation galas, there are about every, almost every singer that is honored will thank Peggy for her, you know, the work she's done with them. So it's, it's right. a very important part of the team and transitioning back, you know, to the singing teacher ultimately, you know, and part of that transition. There's a huge need for a training protocol for people who want to be singing voice specialists but don't want to be speech pathologists. Right. And it is not something that we in the field have come up with yet, unfortunately. Right. It's a question I get all the time. And there's a huge need, and we haven't figured it out yet. Well, Peggy, you have time now, don't you? I mean, no. I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love Definitely. it. Definitely. Well, then I'll be your little book, and let's, you know, move on this. Uh-huh. Well, I want to thank you all uh, for a couple things as we wrap up. First of all, because you've doubly given us your time because last week's uh, technological debacle. So uh, really, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being available again and for your kindness and generosity. I think last week was a good example for all of us of what life would be like if you didn't have a voice. Because you could see the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah. It's true. They couldn't hear us. Um, and if you want to see more of Adam, I'm going to do a very brief shameless plug for the Northwest Voice Conference, the Art and Science of the Performing Voice in Seattle, Washington, May 15, 16. If you just go to northwestvoice.org, Adam will be our keynote along with Mary Sanders Barton and Marcy Rosenberg. So it's a great lineup and a chance to come to the beautiful Seattle. And um, our next Nats chat will be in January on the 12th, and it will be with Tony Award winner Santino Fontana. Thank you, Joan Later, for helping connect me to him. And um, I will look forward to my conversation with Santino. And again, thank you all for joining us and for this great chat. And we are getting many thank yous from our attendees tonight. Yes. Thank, thank you. Everyone, thank you. Have, Sorry. Have happy holidays, and thank you so much for seeing the new year. Thanks. Yes, and we'll have a brief post chat.